Welcome to episode 241 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with Hua Yang Xion to debunk myths about English language learners. Visit truthforteachers.com to get Hua's blog post and check out our new Truth for Teachers Writers Collective, which Hua is part of. This school year has turned out to be, dare I say, unprecedented in its challenges. If your coworkers are burning out and overwhelmed and your administrators feel helpless to do anything about it, let them know about the 40-hour leadership program. It's a new offshoot of my 40-hour teacher work week that's designed to create change at the school level, helping everyone in the building to stay focused on what really makes a difference for kids and then streamline or eliminate the rest. 40-hour leadership can be joined at any time. It's an entirely self-paced program for admins that only requires an upfront time investment of around 10 hours to reimagine systems and simplify processes, which will save everyone in your school building time and energy every single day. We can work with your school to acquire grant funding and professional development money to cover the cost via purchase order. We also offer additional consulting packages for personalized coaching and support. Go to 40htw.com to learn more about the 40-Hour Leadership Program and our other 40-Hour resources that are designed to help educators find a sustainable way of doing a great job for kids. It's 40htw.com. You'll see our six-week fast-track program for teachers there too, which we've recently reopened to new members, as well as our 40-Hour Instructional Coaching Program, all at 40htw.com. Before we begin the app, I would like to make a request that I don't often make. Would you be willing to take 30 seconds right now to leave a quick review for the show on iTunes? You can click through to do it right from your podcast player app. And there's a link in the show notes too, if you're not listening on iTunes. You can just click that um, show notes icon and you'll be able to go to iTunes to leave your review. Every single review helps boost visibility for Truth For Teachers. And that means more educators will discover it. So thank you so much for doing that to everyone who has left a review so far. It is one of the fastest, easiest ways to support the show, and it really means a lot to me. So today I'm sharing six myths about English language learners that I wish I had debunked sooner. These are beliefs and assumptions that I held at the beginning of my teaching career, and I unlearned them slowly over time. I think you'll find that they are super common myths. And in fact, my guest today has also worked through many of them, and she encounters them frequently among her fellow educators. Hua Yang Xion is currently an elementary ESOL teacher, ESOL being an acronym for English for Speakers of Other Languages. She works with students in grades 3 to 5 of various backgrounds, native languages, and English proficiency levels. Hua is a writer for the Truth for Teachers Collective, and she will be sharing articles regularly to help both ESL teachers and general education teachers who have English language learners in their classrooms. I am so grateful to have her expertise, particularly as she is an Asian American, particularly Hmong American, and a bilingual speaker herself. So she has a unique window into what her students experience, which she'll share here. Listen in. So you wrote an amazing article in which you identified um, six myths for Truth For Teachers readers, and I wanted to have you on the podcast to talk to Truth For Teachers listeners about each one. So we're going to go through each of these six myths and talk about how they can impact our instruction. And the first one is that all ELs are born outside of the U.S. First off, I think maybe even before we get into that, let's talk about which acronyms you prefer, because there's all different ones that people are using. Tell me about why you choose EL. Um, I guess that's just the one I'm used to, just English learner, lang- uh, learners. But I know that a lot of EL gurus are now using multilingual learners, which is MLs. So I'm just using ELs because that's what I'm used to, and that's what my school and district use. Okay, that's great. Okay. So the first myth is that all ELs are born outside of the U.S., and that's not true. No, definitely not true. So actually, many ELs are born in the U.S., and most are second and third generation in their families. Um, The U.S. Census data found that 82% of K-5 ELs and 65% of 612 ELs are all U.S. born. 
So that means many ELs that come into our classrooms are born and raised in the U.S. And so most ELs hear and speak another language at home growing up, but in school, they are surrounded and immersed in learning English. So we have to think about their culture, you know, maybe their academic backgrounds and their socioeconomic levels. And we need to think about our students, our, think about our students and families and be aware of these experience and backgrounds they have and that they might not all have that typical American experience, even though they were born and raised here. And so, you know, as educators, we just can't make any of those assumptions. Yes, not making assumptions is so key. Actually getting to know the kids in front of you instead of like who you think they are. Exactly. And I would imagine that many of them also feel sort of torn. You know, if you're born in America and you're surrounded by American culture, Mm -hmm. but yet your home culture is different you know, to be to feel like you're being perceived as an immigrant when in fact you were born and raised here and maybe even your parents were born and raised here exactly. must be so challenging. Yeah. And that, you know, starts that, you know, identity crisis in many, you know, students, whether, you know, it doesn't matter the age and, you know, even myself included, just like, where do I belong? And especially when, you know, we're in school all day and immersed in that, you know, American culture, you know, you try so hard to just, you know, fit in somewhere. And, you know, even then, like when I was, you know, at different events, you know, Hmong events, um, I felt like I didn't fit in there either. So it's like, where do I belong? <laughs> you know, so it's so important for, you know, especially our classroom teachers to just be more aware and uh, more understanding of what different backgrounds and cultures and holidays that students bring to their classrooms. Great. So that first myth that we're busting here is that all ELs are born outside of the U.S. The second is that all ELs are fluent in their native language. And this is one that surprised me when I when I first had when I was a new teacher, I was like, oh, I did not know they actually cannot read in their (laughs) home language. Oh, that's so interesting. I mean, these were third graders. So it's not like, you know, they were really (laughs) fluent readers in any language. (laughs) But this was this was something I learned the hard way. I actually was not prepared for that. Yeah, and I think of myself growing up. And like I said, I so I spoke Hmong until I went to school. And you know, of course, I was immersed in English. And at home, my parents and my grandma, they still talk to me in Hmong, but I was just using English to respond back to them. And so mm-hmm. I started to lose my first language. And I feel that happens a lot with our ELs because we're just, again, so immersed in English. And then, you know, like we were talking before, you want to fit in with everybody else because English is, you know, obviously the primary language used in the U.S. So you just want to keep speaking English. And so, yeah, I started to lose my first language. And, you know, like you said, when we say fluent, you know, that could mean, oh, students might only speak and listen in a language, but they're not able to read and write. Or some students like me, I can read in Hmong, but my speaking is not the greatest anymore. Mm. So being fluent in a language can mean many different things. Mm -hmm. So it's important for districts and schools to develop a home language survey. And um, typically, this is given out to families, you know, all families at the beginning of the school year. Um, It might have some questions like, what's the first, what's a language spoken at home? Um, And the district I'm in now, we, you know, try to tackle more question, language questions like, what's the first language, you know, your child spoke? What's, you know, does your child still speak this language? You know, instead of just having that one question, like, do you speak another language at home? Yes, maybe the parents do, but maybe not the students, you know. Mm -hmm. So we just want to make sure we're not making assumptions and putting students into um, our ESL programs, you know, just like that, just because they might have a different language at home. Right, because they could be, I mean, I've also had students who were so fluent in both languages, they acted as the translator for their families. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've got that situation. I've also had situations where the child was embarrassed of their home language mm-hmm. and their home culture. They were embarrassed of their name. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking to see like they, they only wanted to speak English. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was it was difficult for them because especially if you're not actually that fluent in your in your native language, you mm-hmm. don't want to be. But yet you're also, you know, not quite fluent in English or maybe you speak with an accent. And it right. just it is really um, 
it, there's a lot there for teachers to be paying attention to and be mindful of with these kids. Yes, exactly. So the third myth that we want to debunk is that if you don't know the language that your students speak, then you won't be able to communicate with them. Well, I have students on my caseload, like over 10 different languages. Obviously, I'm not learning 10 different languages <laughs> <laughs> to work in, uh, with my EL families and students. You know, the primary goal of the ESL program is for students to learn English. So you don't need to know another language. And, you know, it does make our job difficult at times communicating with families and students. And, um, you know, thank goodness for many technology translation tools um, nowadays that we're able to communicate with families and students. So, you know, what I recommend to teachers is, again, you know, get to know your students and their families. Again, relationships is so key and understanding their background, where they're coming. And sometimes, you know what, there are no in-person interpreters or even like, you know, using a translation line that could cost like hundreds of dollars. Um, so communicate through, again, whatever technology is free, Google Translate, you know, mm -hmm. visuals and physical gestures. And like you said, sometimes, you know, our students do have to act like translators, you know, and sometimes parents feel comfortable with that, but always just. Um, when you are using any type of translators, whether it be the students or an actual translator, always look at the parents and, you know, like you're talking to them. Even if you both don't understand each other, it just makes them feel more, you know, like confident and more like involved because you are communicating with them. Don't assume things that just because families don't speak English, they don't want to engage. So the next myth is that ELs should only be speaking English at school and at home. Yeah. And oh boy, this is a loaded one that yeah. <laughs> um, many educators still hold. And that I think yes. it's still the expectation in many schools. Like, you know, you need to speak it when you're here, you speak English and mm -hmm. to sort of guilt trip families if your child needs to learn it. So therefore you have to be speaking it at home. And yes. I mean, what an overreach to tell someone what language they should speak in their right. own home. Oh my yes. goodness. Let's unpack that. I've heard this suggested so many times and, you know, not only from teachers and educators, but also from parents too. Like parents will say, okay, you know, we'll, we'll try to speak English more at home or I'll, I'll try mm -hmm. to help them, you know, with their English. And I'm always like mindful and share with families that no, 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 whatever language you use at home, just use that. Because when they're at school, that's our job to help them with their English. So they don't need to worry about that. And actually, when students are fluent, um, whether it be speaking or, you know, listening in one language, it makes the transition to learn another language smoother. Even when the language doesn't have any cognates or similar words in English or to English in their first language, the transition is still just much um, quicker. And because then the students are able to just like make these connections with their first language and then English language. So I always encourage families to use whatever first language at home. Yes. And when we tell families that they have to be speaking in English, then we're operating under the assumption that English is the more important language, right. that English is the, the better language. It's the, it's the language that you need when, I mean, there's so many reasons to keep your, your home language, right? Uh, you know, but on top of the fact that being bilingual is an extremely important skill. Yeah. You know, I only learned English growing up. That's the only language I speak. It is mm -hmm. a detriment to me. Um, you know, I, I am uh, in, in awe of people who speak multiple languages because I never learned. And frankly, I'm too lazy to learn. And I never had, I always had the privilege of not having to learn. Yeah. And I think not, um, not assuming that, you know, English is the most important thing for you to know, but Right. Who knows what that child may do when they grow up? They may be a translator. I mean, obviously, then you need to know English as well, but they're going to get the English. You know, being right. in America, you're, you're going to get yes. that English over time. Yep. What you don't want to do is what has been done for so many years, both intentionally and unintentionally, and that is erase the home language and erase the home culture, which has so much value in the child's identity as well exactly. as in the language acquisition, as you said, when, you know, they're, once you're able to learn one language, you can then learn another and another. Yep. 
And it just broadens the, the child's ability to function in lots of different contexts in the world that those of us who only speak one language don't get to do. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the fifth myth that we're going to cover is that they speak English fine in class. What do you mean by that one? Okay. So we're going to get to kind of like the technical language stuff. So mm -hmm. um, the first kind of language ELs develop is called basic interpersonal communication skills or BICS. So you might hear this word. And so which is just language that um, is needed for um, daily conversations, anything informal or any interactions. So pretty much this is social language. And typically, this takes about one to two years to develop, if not even sooner, because, you know, students, our ELs want to communicate with their friends and communicate with their teachers. So they're picking up on all these words quicker. And um, and so many teachers just assume because the EL can speak to them, you know, ask them daily things. Uh, and in the classroom, it looks like they can understand English. They're fluent now. They know everything. Mm. Okay. And then, but there's this other part, also called cognitive academic language proficiency, or also okay. known as CALP, short for CALP. And that focuses on the content and academic language used in the classroom. So think about like, you know, any of the assessments or tests we give to students and the language it uses um, when it's asking certain questions. And this actually takes over like five to 10 years to develop this wow. type of language. And, you know, depending when, you know, whether our ELs are newcomers or, you know, whenever they come to us, five to 10 years could be their whole, you know, educational mm -hmm. life. <laughs> and so that's why it's so important for educators to focus on scaffolding, scaffolding the content and academic language used in the classroom. Again, visuals, videos you know, sentence frames, uh, vocabulary, word banks. These are all just like everyday tools that helps ELs and non-ELs too to develop and grow that that kelp or that academic language. Right. So not making the assumption that because they seem to speak English fine, they don't need any additional scaffolding, number one. And right. number two, also realizing that everything you do to support ELLs, ELs yeah. also – um, supports kids who are speaking English as their first language. Right. Um, usually they're great strategies for neurodivergent learners. Right. They're for kids who are, you know, struggling with learning to read or working below grade level, um, students with dyslexia, like all kinds of different things. So I think that's where like universal design comes in. It kind of goes into the next myth too, that like um, EL teachers, you know, or ELs can get all the support they need through the ESL teacher. It's so important for, you know, any type of educator, like special ed, speech and language, you know, whatever, all of us to just work together because all those, all the things that we want to do, the scaffolds that we want to try or do in our classrooms, that's for everybody. Right. So that just because you're the gen ed teacher, you don't have to do anything. You just send the kid off to, mm -hmm. you know, to the ESL teacher, and then you can just kind of teach them normally. And right. But you also, on the other hand, you also don't have to change everything just for this one child. The right. best practices for your English language learners are also best practices um, just in general. Mm -hmm. What's something that you wish every teacher understood about working with their EL students? That they have so much to offer in the classroom just because they don't have the language or the background, they have so many other things to offer as well. Um, and honestly, just getting to know them. A lot of our ELs are going through that identity crisis, you know, mm -hmm. even at a young age, um, you know, where do they belong? How should I act? Who, you know, what do I need to do to be involved in the classroom? Um, like many of the ELs that I work with um, are very quiet um, and they don't speak in the classroom. And, you know, yes, they are well behaved and, you know, they don't disrupt or anything. But, you know, because they're just so quiet that, you know, again, it goes back to the assumption that like, oh, yep, they understand everything. Oh, they'll just do anything that I ask. And then, mm. and then you know, Sometimes it's like, oh, they're not talking, so they don't know any English, or they're not talking, so there must be something wrong. 
And, you know, once, you know, I pull them aside or even just, again, just get to know them. Boom. They're like a talking machine. They just cannot (laughs) stop talking. And I'm like, whoa, 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 slow down, you know. And it just goes back to creating that safe and welcoming environment for them, whether it be in a small group or full group. um, I think that just makes such a big difference for many of our ELs because they are struggling with figuring out where do they belong 